I'd like to begin by saying I'm going to have almost no math in this talk. So if you came expecting to hear about black holes or quantum three-dimensional gravity, um, maybe you want to sign up for one of my graduate classes. <laughs> so this lecture is called, what is it called? It's called Live, Math Ma Live Mathematically But Not By The Numbers. So I, I expect most of the members of the audience are students here at Emory, if not. I hope you enjoy the lecture too. Um, but I've been thinking a lot lately about my life, and I want to spread a different kind of idea, one that's maybe mathematical in a way, but certainly it's not one that's based on formulas. So to get started, I'd like to remind you that I was lucky enough to be one of the very first TED speakers. I spoke in 2011. It was a great, it was a great experience, and now it's wonderful to see that this has grown into such a huge event. I think I heard over 1,000 tickets were sold. It's kind of incredible. Anyway, this is a long time ago. It's very cold today, so I'm not wearing my shorts. <laughs> so I'd like to begin by kind of telling you about what I've been doing for the last four years. And there's a point to all of this, so let me tell you. In the last four years, I've been, well, working on math. Maybe you've seen some of the things in the news. I've been thinking about mathematical physics. And I've been thinking about more math, so um, it's been in the news. But more importantly, I've been teaching great students here at Emory. <laughs> I obviously don't have a very large wardrobe. This was intentional. <laughs> so I was very happy, actually, just a few minutes ago, I saw one of my former students who, who graduated from Emory a few years ago. His name is Jared. If you know Jared, um, say hi to him. He just signed a contract to play professional baseball. And he started his own computer company. And it's, it's wonderful to be at a place where uh, the students are so motivated and they end up doing great things. And uh, so I'm very happy to be here and I've been teaching wonderful students. And in fact, if you, if you were paying attention, the musical intro to my lecture was a song by one of my current graduate students, uh, Robert Schneider, who is um, the founding member of Apples and Stereo. In the last four years, I've also been doing math with, well, Indian Indianapolis Colts cheerleaders and astronauts. <laughs> If you are aware of this TV show called Child Genius, my friend here, Leland Melvin, is the, is the moderator of the show. It was super cool. We, we got into the Guinness Book of World Records, uh, participating in the largest chemistry experiment ever. I've been in a documentary about an Indian mathematician by the name of Ramanujan. And I have also been advising movie stars. In fact, this morning I was working on some of the edits related to our marketing uh, a marketing plan for this movie. So later this fall, there's a movie coming out called The Man Who Knew Infinity. It's about the Indian mathematician Ramanujan um, that I'm one of the world experts on. And I got the opportunity to talk to and teach uh, movie stars math. So Dev Patel will play, Jer will play Ramanujan. Jeremy Irons, who you may know better as the voice of Scar, will play a distinguished British mathematician. And it's, 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 was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great fun. I've also got a great family. They're all here. My daughter is a freshman here at Emory. She lives in Long Street, Means. My son is a lot, so I'm probably humiliating her. Um, my son's a bit bigger now, um, but here we are enjoying spring break in, in, near Cancun. I've also liked to do sports. I've been participating in triathlons. I've been to many cool places for work. This was in December. You all know where this is. This is the Taj Mahal. And, um, well, at the end of the day, what I've been doing for the last four years has been a dream. I'm a super happy guy. <laughs> so if you ever happen to take my Math 250 class, or if you know someone who's taken my Math 250 class, they'll tell you that I have a very difficult time beginning my classes. I have to talk for four or five minutes every day about some random thing. And that's, that's important to me. It's one of the things that I really like about teaching here at Emory. So in any event, the TED Talks are about ideas worth spreading. What does this have to do with anything? Well, the most difficult math problem, this is how I want to phrase this talk, the most difficult math problem I think you're ever going to face in your life is this question. How will you choose to live your life? And you might be thinking, what does that have to do with math? Well, this question was actually answered in 2014. <laughs> 
It was actually answered in 2014, last year, in a paper that appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one of, our, one of the most prestigious science journals there is. A group of Cambridge University professors constructed a formula called happiness of T, and I, I won't go into all the parameters, but uh, they took this problem very seriously, and there is an answer. So that's not the idea that I want to spread, right? We might take a little bit of time to figure out how to do the calculus with these parameters. Uh, but let's try to make it a little bit simpler. So what might be a little bit simpler is just to live by some numbers. So this is where my message really begins. And it may come as a shock, but I think what I'm about to say are things that many of you, certainly the, the, the college students the audience, in the audience, these are things that you probably really think about probably all the time which is really why I'm giving this talk. One way you might want to keep it simple and live by the numbers would be to aim for these numbers. <laughs> ah, you're laughing, you know what I'm talking about. A good GPA, 3.8 or better. In high school, maybe you're supposed to take at least nine AP classes. I actually heard of someone who took 18 AP classes. I didn't even know that was possible. A high class ranking, nearly perfect SAT scores. You want to go to a top college. You want to go to a top graduate program. And at the, end of the at the end of the day, you hope that you get a high salary. Maybe million dollar salaries are good. These are numbers that maybe you want to live by. Okay, but now you're maybe you're not laughing as quickly. Now you're probably wondering where I'm going with this. Well, I used to live by the numbers. That's, you can probably tell which one was me. This is 1985. <laughs> I used to live by the numbers. My parents uh, were very much into living by the numbers. Maybe if you're Asian American, you kind of get it. That's the kind of family that I grew up in. And so I dropped out of high school, tried to go to college early, which I did. I wanted to graduate early. It was always a race about getting good test scores. Graduating early, it was all about the numbers. And in fact, to be quite honest, everything about my family for, for a long time was about living about the numbers. My father's a math professor, so I, it was inescapable. So how did that work out for me? So I just told you I'm a super happy guy, so you might think that it did work out for me. But the message of this story is that actually there was a very important change in my life that I want to tell you about. Before this change, uh, how was it working out? Well, this is how I viewed college. This is how I viewed classes. Let's read it. Classes were obstacles to a high GPA. I thought of it as I had a 4.0 before first day of class, and all that could possibly happen is that my GPA would go down. I dodged hard classes, and I perfected the skill of getting by with minimal effort. I viewed college as a mathematical problem, an optimization problem. How do I choose my courses, budget my time, so on and so forth, to get the optimal grades? And I was actually pretty good at it. I actually even got graduated with a fairly good GPA. I got my PhD in three years from UCLA, and it looked like it was working out well for me. But the reality is that I was totally cheating out on myself. I didn't write the best possible thesis. I can't begin to say that that's true. And so I took my PhD advisor, Basil Gordon, in 1992, who taught me a lot of things in life. And a lot of things I'm about to tell you over the next few minutes are some of the things that he taught me. And this is why I'm a happy guy. So this is me in 1992, a year before I finished my PhD. and. Uh, to orient what the idea is that I want to share with you, let me just kind of review why it is we might want to live by the numbers. Well, you might be seeking prestige or exclusivity, maybe a privileged life. And certainly a lot of people would argue that it could be the pursuit of wealth. This may be the reasons you want to live by the numbers. But the mathematical problem I started with is how will you choose to live your life do these things really play into that optimization problem? Quite frankly, I think it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So do any of those things matter from your deathbed? I raise that now because I recently attended a sermon by Danny Golden. He's, a, he's an area pastor, and he gave a lecture on how you choose to live your life. I was really taken by that. And in this lecture, he, he quotes from Bonnie Ware, who was a fairly well-known, maybe some of you have even read her books. She, she was a hospice nurse in Australia. She's now writes, um, uh, in, in, she's an inspirational writer. And among the top deathbed regrets that she learned over time, here are three of the top five. One, why didn't I live a life true to myself? 
Two, why did I work so hard living the life that was expected of me? And three, I wish that I'd let myself be happier. These are not questions or thoughts that you should be having from your deathbed. You've, time's run out. You maybe optimized the wrong formula. So this is my idea. Maybe this isn't what you're all expecting from me, but I want you to live mathematically. I have actually two points here. It's not going to be about solving for x. It's about how you can be a good mathematician, how you can be a good scientist. So for me in this lecture, living mathematically is the idea that's worth spreading. And for me, it means the following four things. I really want you to appreciate and seek creativity in your own work. Be curious, seek and extract meaning. Two, be, fle be flexible. Be willing to approach problems from different points of view. Be confident and determined. Have the courage to manipulate intricate ideas. Have the confidence to attack challenges even when a solution isn't obvious. In fact, overcoming difficult challenges when you don't know that you can at the, at, at the outset, they're the challenges that are worth defeating. And lastly, be rigorous. Pay attention to details. Okay. So I want to go one by one through these four characteristics and explain to you how that's helped me. So, that, so it's pretty clear. Reality. The reality is that being crea creative and curious has personally helped me while well, do my work. It's helped me find new phenomena about numbers and black holes. Helps me teach my students and movie stars. If I'm not really interested in, in, in the beauty of my subject, how could I possibly teach it? And three, and this impacts certainly all of us, if you are creative, it's much more likely that you'll be able to enjoy the world in which you live. Super complicated thing. You, I want you to embrace that. How about being flexible? Well, being flexible and open to different ideas has personally helped me solve 100-year-old math problems. A problem that's been around 100 years is not going to, is not going to be, allow itself to be defeated by using standard techniques. You have to do something new. And so, of course, being flexible with your ideas is important. To be a teacher, if you teach a subject in one way and one way only, you're only going to be reaching those students who are able to accept ideas in that, in that way. So being flexible and open to different idea, ideas helps me do my job. And of course, perhaps most importantly, you, you're probably getting the idea, here's the last bullet item is the one that I'm selling. Being flexible and open to different ideas helps you meet people from different cultures and different backgrounds. How about confidence and determination? Well, that's clear, too, I think. Being confident and determined helped me battle a problem, a math problem for 20 years. The partitions came up earlier today. Believe it or not, there was a math problem that I worked on for 20 years. That should be almost the definition of determination. And you know what? I won. A few years ago, I won. And I was so, so happy that I didn't give up on myself when so many steps along the way I could have quit. Certainly being confident and determined is useful in triathlons, right? They're hard. And most importantly, gives you the courage to try new things without fear. Allows you, offers you the, the, it gives you permission to try things without worrying about what other people will think of what it is that you do. Being rigorous, attention to detail, this is also very important. In fact, this is the, the, perhaps the most important thing I try to teach in my Math 250 class. For me, math, for me, mathematically, it's helped me discover something in the theory of quantum modular forms where this statement, infinity minus infinity equals 4, actually makes sense. People wrote newspaper articles about my formula, infinity minus infinity equals 4, and it's, it, it, it's, it's related to the arithmetic of black holes. And of course, why do we really want to stress rigor? It's because rigor allows you to find opportunities in unexpected places. So, is a society living by the numbers? Let's, let's, let, let's, let's expand this a little bit. I'm afraid we are. It's kind of crazy. Here are some super popular books. I hope you don't have them. Um, one, there's a book called Learn to Play the Piano in 10 Easy Lessons. Every time you turn on the news, you hear about political polls, Gallup, CNN. There's even this super popular book. Well, there's a whole super, super popular series of books called Something for Dummies. But here is the book that's about everything for dummies, <laughs> right? Do we actually believe any of this stuff? Could the world possibly be that simple? So why, where am I going with this? Well, I'm afraid that we are 
asking for an oversimplistic life, whether it's your own goals or whether it's society's goals. And it's, it, I think it's fairly clear to me that le leading, living sorry, by the numbers leads to an oversimplification of critical thought, undermining of intellectual standards, trivializing of academic, artistic, and cultural capital, and all of that adds up to intolerance. This is the universe in which I'm afraid we're, we are, we're living in, and it's, and it's frightening to me. So what is the idea that, that I want you to spread? I want to spread the idea of living mathematically. And let me offer you some global situations in which I think it's important. One, we live at a time where we probably offer too much in, uh, in the way of standardized testing. Talk to anyone who's taught a high school, high school class, and they'll tell you that they hate standardized testing, or at least over-testing, because over-testing hinders creativity, flexibility, confidence, and rigor. You're losing the point behind what you're supposed to be learning and teaching. Here's an amazing fact. One in four Americans believe that the sun revolves around the Earth. We're at Emory, so it's the zero, zero out of the whole room, okay? <laughs> but, but that's true. One in four Americans believes that the sun revolves around the Earth. 30% of Americans can't even find the Pacific Ocean on the map. I mean, that's not a small thing, right? Your GPS, <laughs> your GPS device in your car can find, you know, Starbucks, can find 50 Starbucks, you know, in, 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 in Atlanta, but there, a lot of people can't even find the Pacific Ocean. And here's the most frightening thing to me. Over 50% of the U.S. House of Representatives routinely denies the fi findings of the scientific organizations that they choose to fund. How crazy is that? So what is the idea that's worth spreading? I want you to live mathematically, and I'd, I'd like people to pause and think about what that means. It involves creativity, flexibility, confidence and determination and rigor. These are skills that aren't just important for mathematicians. These are just important human skills. And what's my dream? My dream here is that everyone will choose to live mathematically, which I think is equivalent to choosing happiness. If someone told me that I was going to die next month, uh, that would suck. I'd be kind of unhappy about that. <laughs> but I can tell you right now that I would know that I lived a life, right? I made that decision in the early 90s to really ignore so many of the other things. And I'm a happy guy. And you know what? If you're a happy guy, people around you are happy. And my experience has been that you get opportunities when you don't expect them. And more importantly, Globally, I'd like you to join this movement. Join the movement to live mathematically with this important goal, namely that of restoring the value of academic, artistic, and cultural capital. All right, thank you very much.